What's up guys and welcome to this tutorial. Okay, we're going to be going over the 2018 supplementary exam um, from March and okay, so we're going to be doing the multiple choice questions. There are 10 questions, okay, um, and as per my usual advice, I suggest that you guys do these questions at the end of your paper rather than the beginning because some of them are made to trick you. Okay, but let's get straight into it. Okay, question one. <clears throat> okay, so basically when a force F moves an object through a displacement S in the direction of the force, the work done by the force is given by the equation W is equal to F times S. How many vector and scalars now, does this equation have? Okay, so basically we have to identify what the vectors and the scalars are. Okay, so let's start with a force. A force is a vector. Okay, and displacement, or let's just say S, is our displacement, and that is also a vector. And lastly, we have work, which is a scalar. Okay, so the solution is one scalar and two vector, which would be answer A. Okay, so if we weren't sure what work is, here's a bit of a rule. Okay, so if we have a vector, no, okay, so let's say a scalar times a scalar, so two scalar quantities is equal to a scalar. A scalar times a vector is equal to a vector. Um, a scalar or a vector times a vector is equal to a scalar. Again, okay, and obviously this can also be written as a vector times a scalar is equal to a vector. Okay, so let's apply that rule here. Okay, so we have, in this situation, we have force, which is a vector, times displacement, which is a vector. So it's a situation right here, and the work is a scalar, therefore. Okay, so we can apply this to other things as well. Okay, question 1.2. Okay, so let's just put 1.1 .1 is equal to A. Cool stuff. Okay, a bike starts at the origin and its velocity along the straight line is represented on the velocity versus time graph shown. During which intervals is the bike traveling towards the origin? Okay, so remember that our area under a velocity time graph gives us the displacement. Okay, or the yeah, so it gives us the displacement. So our area under the velocity time graph gives us our displacement. So in this region right here, we have a positive area. So he's moving away from the origin. And in this region right here, we have a negative. Let's, we have a negative area. So we are moving backwards or towards the origin, okay? So basically, in this region here, between one and seven seconds, we're moving in the positive direction, which is away from the origin. At this point right here, at seven seconds, our velocity is zero, and from there onwards, we're moving backwards. So we're moving back towards the origin, okay? So our answer would be D. So question 1.2 is D. Cool stuff. <clears throat> okay. So a model car completes one lap around a track of 400 meters at an average speed of 5 meters per second. And then a second lap at, a velocity, at an average velocity V, or average speed V. The average speed for completing both laps was 8 meters per second. What was the average speed for the second lap? Okay. So the average speed for both of them, okay, so let's just write down our equation. Our governing equation is going to be speed equals distance over time, okay? So basically, we can work out, we can use the time variable to get everything we need, okay? So first, I'm going to focus on the first part, okay? So I'm going to write this as time is equal to distance over speed, okay? So I'm going to label this part one, okay? So part one, sorry about that. So we need that right there, okay? So part one, we're gonna say the time is equal to 400, 400 meters over five, which gives us a time of, of 80 seconds, okay? So that's T1. T2 is our unknown, and T3 
is going to be our total. So we know that T does two laps, so T3 is going to be for two laps. So two laps would be a distance of 800 meters. And we know that he does it at a velocity, oh man, or oh speed, yeah. Okay, so we know that he does it at a speed of 8 meters per second. So we know that this would be 100 seconds. So that means if the total time, that's T3, okay, so T1 plus T2 has to equal T3 because T3 is the total time. So we have 80 plus T2 equals um, 100. So from this we get t2 equals 20 seconds okay now we just need to substitute into this equation right here and we get that the speed is equal to we know the second lap is also 400 meters and it's done in 20 seconds so 400 divided by 20 gives us 20 meters per second so our answer is d okay so 1.3 d Okay, so there are other ways we could have done this, we could have looked at other variables, but I find that this is probably the easiest way and the way that makes the most sense. Okay, cool. So now we're going to the next question, 1.4. A ball is thrown vertically upward and returns to the thrower's hand. Um, air resistance, okay, ignore air resistance. Which of the following best describes the direction of the acceleration during its flight? So we're looking at the acceleration as the ball moves up, upwards at the top of the flight and as it moves downwards. Okay, so let's think about it. So right here we have a boy. Let's see. Okay, so we have... Oh, okay, as you can see I'm not an artist. But we have a boy and he's throwing the ball upwards. Okay, so what is the acceleration? Remember, this is essentially a free fall kind of question. Free fall kind of question. So the acceleration at the start or when it's traveling upwards is equal to um, taking downwards, uh, taking upwards, okay, so we'll just say 9,8 meters per second squared down, okay? So we know that's what it's doing as it travels upwards. As it's moving upwards, it's doing acceleration of 9.8 meters per second up, okay? And at the top, we have the same 9,8, so this is just due to gravity, and as it comes back downwards, it's got the same 9,8 meters per second squared, and again, it's acting downwards. So our answer is downwards, downwards, and downwards. So our answer is A. So for question 1.4, A. Okay, cool stuff. Okay, so a box, uh, or a 20.4 kilogram box remains at rest. Okay, so it remains at rest on a horizontal surface while the box is pushed ver horizontally with a force of 60 newtons. The coefficient of static friction between the box and the surface is 0 0.6. Which of the frictional force, or which is the force of friction acting on the box during the pushing or during the push? Okay, so let's think about this. So let's start off with a free body diagram. Okay, so we have a force push equals 60 newtons. We've obviously got our force normal got our mg and we've got our force friction and we know that it is not moving it is at rest yeah so it does not move so it's at rest so what we're going to do is we're going to take the sum of the forces in the right direction is equal to mass times acceleration obviously if it's not moving it's equal to zero so then we have force push minus force friction is equal to six, uh, is equal to zero. So the force friction is equal to the force push, which is 60 newtons, which is D. So 1.5 D. Okay, so this value right here, coefficient of friction is just there to trick you. Remember, only when it starts moving does it experience that frictional force, um, force friction uh, mu m okay so or force normal other mu force normal okay remember it only experience that when moving okay if it's if the force is less than that it experiences the force um that's that it experiences essentially the frictional force is equal to the force um being applied okay so that there is a little bit of a tricky question because it's giving you some unnecessary information don't care about that value right there
Okay, so we're going to move on to question six. Two identical spheres, each with a mass m, and traveling with a velocity v, move towards each other in an isolated system. Okay, the spheres have a head-on elastic collision. Okay, so what does the elastic collision tell us? It tells us that the ek before is equal to the ek after. Okay, so the spheres stick together on impact. Well, we haven't really been given much information about that, so we're going to leave that. The total kinetic energy after the impact is that. Okay, so let's test this. The only way to do it is to test all the options. Okay, so the EK before is equal to a half m v squared plus a half m and the opposite, they're traveling in opposite directions, let's take that direction as positive, so the second one has minus v squared, okay? But obviously that's just a half mv squared plus a half mv squared, which is equal to mv squared, okay? And we know that the ek before is also equal to our ek after because of elastic collision, okay? So there's our answer. Okay, so let's just check the other options as well. The total kinetic energy before impact is zero. That is not true because we've already shown that. And the total mo momentum before impact is that. Okay, so let's see. Our momentum, our momentum is going to look something like this. Our momentum, let's say P, is equal to M, so P, we're taking that direction as positive, V, uh, MV, and then plus same mass but different velocity direction so we have mv minus mv which is equal to zero so it cannot be equal to d so our answer for 1.6 is b okay happiness good stuff okay question 1.7 the particle with mass m and velocity v is moving through a vacuum and the kinetic okay is moving through a vacuum. The kinetic energy of the particle is increased by a factor of four. What will the new speed um, of the particle be essentially? Okay, so let's think about this. Okay, so let's see, Ek in the vacuum is equal to a half mv squared. Okay, then we multiply this by four, so the kinetic energy is increased, so Ek Say old ek new is equal to half. I'm going to say four times a half mv squared. Okay, and the mass of the object, the mass is a constant. We can't change the constant, so we have to incorporate this four into the v squared. Okay, and obviously we have to do that like this: a half m times two v squared. Okay, so because these two statements are now equal. These two are now equal, okay? And obviously the old V was, this was the old V, and this is the new V. So our new velocity is two V. And so the answer for question 1.7 is going to be A, okay? Cool stuff, not so difficult, okay? So question 1.8. Two charges, uh, minus Q and plus Q, are fixed in place on the x-axis as is shown. Okay, they both have the same distance. What is the direction of the resultant electric field at the point labeled P, a distance D along the axis? Okay, so let's think about this. Okay, so with um, electric fields, so we always... Um, look at the direction with respect with respect to the uh, a positive um, a positive point charge. Okay, so we always care about a positive point charge being placed at that at point P. Okay, so if we place the positive point charge positive point charge right here, okay, this Q is going to want to pull it. That direction okay because they attract opposites attract each other okay and at the same time that Q is going to try and repel 
p because they are the same so they're going to try uh, so like like charges will try to repel each other okay but the magnitudes of the horizontal forces so this is pulling that that way the same amount that this is pulling that this way and so the resultant is that we have this point charge p moving in that direction only so that would be horizontally to the left so the answer would be c sorry c okay so question 1.8 is equal to c okay so question 1.9 an electric circuit with three different resistors is connected as shown across a battery of negligible internal resistance how do the readings on the ammeter and voltmeter change as the resistance of the variable x is increased okay so basically we have our ammeter here and our voltmeter here as shown okay so i'm actually going to put in a voltmeter right here called v1 okay so v1 um v1 does not change based on uh, what's happening with x right so our governing equation is v equals ir so if we rearrange this for i we have v over r okay if our v stays the same okay and our r we don't mess with this very uh, with this resistor z so it's also the same so therefore our current through this um through this part our current is going to stay the same so there's going to be no change so we're dealing with either c or d okay i'm also going to rename this to let's draw one here v2 and v3 okay we also know that v1 is equal to v2 plus v3 okay so we increasing this resistance um we increasing we're increasing the resistance of r right so using this equation right here using the same equation if we increase r and the current in both branches stay the same v2 is going to go up okay so v1 is the same is equal to v2 goes up and therefore v3 must go down to balance this okay so we can say that there is a decrease so our option is c so we have C. So 1.9 C. Okay. And here we go. The last question. A wire has a conventional current I directed to the right as shown in the diagram. Okay, we've got a nice diagram. At point P, what is the direction of the associated magnetic field? Okay, so for here, for this, we're essentially going to use the right hand solenoid rule. Okay, so we put our right thumb in the direction of the current. So basically our hand looks something like maybe I should do it here. Our hand's gonna look something like this. We've got our finger. Okay, I'm not an artist. So there and our fingers pointing one, two, three, four. No, made a mistake there. One, two, three. Okay, there we go. So we've got four five fingers like a normal human being. Um okay, and we've got our thumb in the direction of the current. And then these are curling, let's say, like this. So our fingers, our, our hand is actually underneath and it's curling upwards. Okay, so it's going out of the plane. So at P, we have out of the plane. So our answer is B. So for question 1.10, the answer is B. And using the right hand solenoid rule. Okay. Cool stuff, guys. Um, thanks for watching. In the next video, I'll probably do question two. Um, yeah, I hope you guys found this useful and everything made sense. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Cheers.